Okay, you do this one. Okay. All right. It is 7.02, and with that gavel, I will call to order the Tuesday, May 10th, Ross Valley School District Board of Trustees regular meeting. Thank you very much for gaveling us in, uh, ladies. Um, and our uh, today, our first, I'm going to just, we are all here. And our first order of business that we start every meeting with is the Pledge of Allegiance. And often before we do the Pledge of Allegiance, we take a moment to just quickly reflect on democracy, which is why we do the Pledge of Allegiance. So it's not just a performative thing that you do rotely. Um, one of the things sometimes that we do is that we are all here in person, which is wonderful to see everybody out here in the audience in person. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. And as we are in person here today, um, I just want to acknowledge that we are having this meeting on the <coughs> ceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of the present day Marin and Sonoma, present day Marin and Southern Sonoma counties. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors, past, present, and emerging. And before we say the Pledge of Allegiance, if everybody would just close their eyes for one second, just close your eyes for one second, and in your mind, for whatever you feel like, think of an image for yourself of what democracy means to you. An image in your mind of what democracy means to you. Okay, hold that image with you as we say the Pledge of Allegiance. And would a couple of you like to come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Do you want to come up? No? You can do it from there. You can do it from there. You can do it from there. So here's our flag up here. Oh, right here. Thank you. One, two. Three. Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, our next order of business before we get going is to um, adopt the agenda that we have before us and the time allocations. So I'm going to go ahead and look at my colleagues up here on the dais to see if anybody has any questions about the agenda or the time allocations or amendments. No question. And if there are not any other questions, we can go ahead if somebody wants to make a motion. So moved. So moved and I second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. And we'll do a vote to make sure that we're all good with that. Brian? Aye. Aye. Charlie? Aye. Rachel? Aye. All right. So our agenda for this evening has been adopted. Now we will move on to the most exciting part of this evening. Well, yes, the most exciting part of this evening, which is our student presentations. Sure. Um, and we are so excited and happy to have two schools this evening um, here giving a spotlight on each of their schools. We have Brookside Elementary and White Hill Middle. And we're going to start this evening off with our Brookside students. And what we would love is for you to introduce yourselves. And if you could please introduce also who brought you here this evening. If you're here with a family member or a friend's parent, that kind of thing, just let us know who you brought. All right, along with you to enjoy this amazing presentation. We're so excited to hear about it. Um, Miss. Barry, okay. you, there you yeah. are. Okay, great. <laughs> we have a nice packed room today for all of our students to present yes, and our teachers as well. I'm not going to say much because I really want all the time to go for the teachers and the students to talk. But I will say at Brookside, we talk about being Brookside proud. And as you can see from Stella's shirt, she's wearing our Brookside proud logo. Yep. And I will be beaming with pride this evening um, for all the important work that students 
parents and teachers have done. Teachers have created, created a safe space in their classrooms um, and really taken the lead in our racial equity and social, social justice work with students. And students will be talking about their racial equity journeys tonight. The slideshow is showing some of the work that happens um, in their classrooms every day. It's not possible to actually put all of it into a slideshow. And of course, none of this could happen without the collaboration and support of all the families and guardians from home. And um, we greatly appreciate that collaboration. And I'm excited to hear everything that the students want to say personally about their journey with this work. So thank you. I'm going to introduce Rachel Rosen our fourth, fifth combination teacher. And then we also have Stacy Walden, a fifth grade teacher here tonight. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here tonight. It's to be welcomed and to actually get to share all the great work that our students are doing um, in the upper grade, like fourth and fifth grade. Um, so I do have the privilege to have both of um, both group students, but their journey has just blown me away in terms of the connections they're making with their own identities and their personal connections um, within their home life in the real world. And um, we just get to see a glimpse of it tonight, but um, we have done so much work and I look forward to more work to come and more time for them on their journey. Tonight, we'd like to introduce you to some of the stewards of Brookside School, our student leaders. We'd like to thank the board and Superintendent Trahan, the parents and students, and Principal Barry Goujon for inviting us to share our experiences with you. These students were ambassadors of our racial equity walk our gallery walk. The students are fifth graders who have dug deep inside themselves this year on personal journeys of racial and social justice. Journeys that we've come to understand as equity and inclusion, human rights. A journey of anti-racism is a lifelong practice of striving for personal bests. It's been a close companion to our social emotional learning, our curriculum and instruction. Not only did these students hold leadership roles for our racial equity gallery walk, but they led conversations in our classroom, shared their personal narratives, and embraced their cultural identities in very deep, very courageous, and very meaningful ways. For these students, their journeys have been very positive and very, very reflective and very prideful. It certainly has been a career highlight for me to guide our students this year. We'd like to introduce you to our change makers. <coughs> Where I go? <laughs> Hi, my name is Stella. I just want to thank you all for welcoming us here tonight. When I was little, I only really knew a bit about my background. Being a fifth grader in Miss Walden's class has helped me learn more about my heritage. She does fun projects for her students to learn more about social justice, racial justice, her background, and so many more. The first project we did that helped me learn more about my background was the identity part. Every student included where their name came from, their passions, favorite foods, and so much more. Around the time of early November, we celebrated Dia de los Muertos. Each of the students got to choose a loved one that had passed away and got to make a whole diorama of them. I did my great-grandma Lisa on my mom's side. She was a harpist who loved parties and music more than anything. Since then, we've done countless slideshows like ABCs of Black History, civil rights presentations, social justice social justice slideshows, the talks like women's rights, and body positivity. I have definitely enjoyed all of the holidays we have celebrated, like the Lunar New Year or Nauru's the Persian New Year. I love Mrs. Walden's class, and I never went on. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Lindley Berger, and I brought my mom, my mom's boyfriend, and my sister. Hello, my name is Lindley and I'm Korean. At first glance, you might notice I'm Asian, but that's not just who I am. I struggled with my identity for years, but today I'm here to share with you what I learned this year. I've learned more things about myself than I, thought I ever thought I could. My personal journey has shaped me and taught me more things about, about people than I thought was possible. Like finding out some of my classmates are biracial. 
Until this year, I didn't have any connection with my past. In the last few years, I have shown more interest in my culture, including recognized racial injustice and how racial injustice can affect a kid. An example of racial injustice is when people bluntly assume I'm Chinese. Sadly, these assumptions aren't rare. A few months ago, I was asked to watch the Chinese team at the Olympics. The woman asking me these questions thought I was Chinese. These little tiny assumptions add up to the point of normality. Imagine this, every little assumption, every hurtful comment, every single person who misjudges you counts as a pebble. These pebbles add up and you can't handle the pressure anymore. You crack and you fall. This is what it feels like to be misjudged. You're not misjudged of something you said or something you did. You're misjudging your, 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 you're misjudging your identity and who you are as a person. I've learned to understand people's problems, differences, and to stand up for myself and others. And now I correct people. Bullying, for example, is a different kind of injustice, but it's still as important as racism. They both make you feel horrible about something you did that you can't change. Thank you. Hi, my name is Quinn, and I brought um, my mother and my sister. Um, ever since I was in kindergarten, I knew I was a quarter Chinese, but I didn't un really understand what it meant. When I was little, the only way I the, the only way I celebrated being Chinese was Chinese New Year. And truth be told, the only thing I liked about it was the red envelopes with money in them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is how I thought of myself throughout the years in, 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 until fifth grade in Miss Walden's class. This year, I've grown in learning my biracial heritage. I even found I was 50% Eastern European. Throughout the years, Miss Walden has done many projects with the class to help us understand our heritage and to and to teach anti-racism. During, during Lunar New Year, she and a Chinese American teacher um, shared and celebrated with us. We read books like Rising Star, Made a Lantern, Ate Authentic Food, and attended an interview with G. Lai Chang, an author of The Red Scarf Girl. We learned new vocabulary words like miscegenation, <laughs> Um, and abolition. In previous school years, I didn't engage in class conversations because I was scared. Now I do, and I don't regret it. In, in, in conclusion, Miss Walden has helped everybody in her class own their identity and, grows as a, and grow as a social justice advocate. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Leah E, and I'm a person of color and biracial. My mom is Eritrean, Eastern African, my dad is Jewish, Jewish from New York. From fourth grade to fifth grade, I've grown so much. I have taken in being a person of color. One of the books I've related to was Stacy Extraordinary Words. Mm -hmm. Stacy Abrams wrote, wrote about her memory <coughs> of, her, of being a little girl in school mm -hmm. and all that she had to do overcome. Now she's running for governor of Georgia again. I have noticed that there have been more diverse books like Stacey Extraordinary Awards. Even Sesame Street has its first Korean American Muppet named Ji Young. Miss Walden has shown me that each student has a voice. I've, I've got to be more, I have got to be an ambassador for the racial justice walk. Some of the pictures here are on the gallery, on the gallery walk. Um, the gallery walk, and I even made my own slideshow called The Power of Kindness, showing what a, what a bystander is and an upstander. Thank you for listening to how I've grown. Hi, my name is Danny. I've grown in the area of social justice, and I would like to share my thoughts on two books I have enjoyed and learn from this year. The books are I Didn't Stand Up and Separate is Never Equal. Both books and to realize everyone's voice is important and should be heard. My voice and my experiences are, val are valuable. As a part of my learning, I have made stronger connections with my identity, my family, and culture. I've enjoyed learning about social justice and standing up for what's right. Hello, my name is Ariana. This year in my class, I have learned a lot about social justice and how it impacts people all over the world. We have learned about different cultures from Southeast Asia, Asia itself, Latin America, 
and so many more racial ethnicities worldwide. I have made many connections on my equality journey, and I believe everyone deserves equality. I got to share my Iranian heritage with my classmates and be proud for who I am. Everyone should be proud of who they are inside and out, and people should never, ever be afraid of showing their true selves to anyone. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zara. It's amazing to think how much I've learned in the past few months. From the start of this school year, Ms. Walden had us digging deep into our identities. My first project in Ms. Walden's class was about personal identity, which taught me more about the origins of my name. Then we got to do the Dia de los Muertos project. I interviewed my grandmother to learn more about my great-grandfather and how he came to this country from Germany with his family after World War II. I like learning about holidays from other cultures. It's also fun to share holidays that my family celebrates with my friends, like Lunar New Year and Diwali. I'm thankful that Ms. Walden has helped me learn about and appreciate cultures from all around the world. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liliana. I would like to share about how learning about social justice has impacted me this year. My grandparents came to this country from Colombia. They faced many challenges. We have been studying immigration and refugees in school this year. My grandparents faced similar experiences where other immigrants face. For example, they do not speak the same language. They speak Spanish. I can understand Spanish, and since I was a toddler, I learned, ch I learned two languages. It was my sorry. I love learning about social justice. It has made me think a lot about everyone in the world. We have had the chance to read many books and learn about the lives of many different and brave historical people from different races and cultures. It makes me feel upset for all the people that have been hurt. I think that it is unfair that people have been treated so horribly throughout history and even in today's events. However, it makes me happy as well to see how people are trying to fix the current racial injustices. And, and I believe it has helped a lot, but more improvement is most definitely needed. For example, I recently went to a Tesla factory with my dad in, and I noticed employees were sitting in the hot sun waiting for a bus. Why were they there, I wonder? Maybe the employees might not make enough money to own their own vehicles. Maybe race is a factor. Or why doesn't the company provide a bus? Or maybe there's a bigger problem I do not even see. These are the questions I ask in my daily life. I have been asking because of my social justice learning. Thank you for your time. Yes. Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. That was yeah. wonderful to hear from each of you. And it really showed in everything that each of you said how important and critical uh, this work is to not only you as an individual, but to also um, all of our students and all of our schools and our families, our staff, and our community. So thank you so much, Ms. Walden and Ms. Rosen, for leading the way for your students. And I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge Julia Walcott, our Director of Curriculum Instruction, who has been super instrumental in everything that we've been doing. And we didn't get to meet all of the people who brought you here. Some of you remembered, but if you could please, every one of you, go back and introduce who brought you. What is your mom's name, your sister's name, your mom's boyfriend? Introduce them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, again, I'm Stella, and I brought my mom, Paula. Okay, so I brought my mom and my mom's boyfriend and my sister, but I get my Asian heritage from my dad, who sadly is not here. That's okay. Uh, I brought my mom where I get my Chinese culture uh, named Kelly, and I brought my sister named Olive. Um, I brought my mom on here, and my dad Todd, and my sister Layla. I brought my dad and my mom uh, where I got my Spanish culture. <laughs> Uh, name Shanine, and sadly my dad couldn't make it, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> I brought my dad, Rogier. 
Susan, my dad, Jason, and my brother, Spencer. And thank you all so very much for bringing your children here to be with us tonight. It's always a special treat because we get to hear about the wonderful things going on in the schools, but don't always get to be there to experience them directly. And it is really special always when we have students because if it weren't for you all, None of us would be here. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for showing us how important and critical all the work that we do in schools is. And um, just so impressed and so happy. Thank you so much for coming. All right, and do you, we're, usually do we do another little tradition, which is um, we have a little something for you to thank you for coming. And also we would love for you to get a picture with all the trustees. And so um, before we move on to White Hill, do you mind all the students um, who presented tonight? Can you come on up? And then we're going to come around this side. And we have something yeah. for you. Okay. This is my young Really young? You still where you are. Good. And we want to thank Miss Machado, Teresa, for making these for you all. They're crafty. Very crafty. <laughs> and I did like to also make mention, of course, of Miss Barry Goujon, the principal of Brookside, because under her leadership at the school, is what makes everything happen. And so, or do you want to stay back there but get maybe a little closer? Oh, yeah. That way. Sure. Come back oh, over yeah. there. And Miss Barry. Miss Rosen, Miss Walden, come on. Okay. You got to be up in the picture. Yes. Okay. Audion, you better send this to my mom. <laughs> 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 and you don't have to stay if you would like to all go, but you're more than welcome if you'd like to get a little sneak peek into White Hill. Bring it on in next year. <laughs> But you guys aren't staying for the whole meeting. Did somebody drop a hair tie? What? Hair tie? <laughs> hair tie? Is it a hair tie? No. Maybe not. Hair <laughs> tie. Okay. Hair tie. Mystery tie. Mystery tie. All right. Well, thank you, Brookside Bears. Thank you. All right, and next we have White Hill Wildcats. Woohoo! All right, well, when uh, Ms. Lumarski and I went to Brookside a few years ago, now, we were impressed with the fifth graders for good reason. So we cannot wait for them to be at White Hill next year. Yeah. They, uh, they presented very well, and we're excited to welcome them. Um, tonight, we have uh, our presentation spans two very important areas. One, um, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Lubomirsky. So we're going to be talking about two areas. And um, one of the things coming out of the pandemic, which we're still still in, but one of the things that was really important to us as we reentered school this year um, was socializing our students again. Our eighth grade students entered this year um, the last time they had a full school year without interruption, they were in fifth grade. So it was a really long time ago. Um, so it is really important for us that our students are well-rounded. They're able to socialize. They missed out on a lot of those opportunities. So we're going to be talking about getting back to normal and building community. Uh, we have uh, two teachers that lead our spirit club, Mr. Openshane and Ms. Vidal. They're going to be... They're gonna be talking about a little bit about the White Hill experience and what that means to us and why it's so important for our students. Um, and then our eighth grade English teachers, Ms. Fox and Ms. Wild, 
are going to be uh, presenting about the other part of the Whitehill experience, which is academics. Um, and they've been leaders on our campus in our racial equity work. Uh, our humanities classes really have been through English and through history over the last couple of years. Um, and they're going to kind of give you a glimpse of where we've been, where we started, and where, where we are, and where we plan on going uh, with our racial equity work in our English department. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to the important people, the experts, Mr. Obenshade and Ms. Vidal. And they're going to talk about Spirit Club and introduce some students. Well, thank you. Um, so I've been, I don't know, do I need a microphone or am I allowed to go up? You're allowed. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I never, I never use any back. Uh, so I've been uh, co-leading the Spirit Club for the last three years. Um, and it's, as Matt just mentioned, it's been a kind of crazy three years with COVID and all that stuff. Um, but from the beginning, the goal was really to make spirit less a thing of just like, we have this spirit day and this one fun day, and then you don't think about it. Um, it's really been to try to turn it into something that is more of an entire whole school community. So we made some strides this year in terms of creating spirit teams, um, but we're really hoping to kind of continue to grow in that regard and make spirit at White Hill something that is a kind of more daily thing rather than this kind of random, we have some events and days and it's fun and then we forget about it. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to the kids to talk about some more stuff uh, here. And introduce if anybody brought you, okay? Oh, introduce, yeah. <laughs> I brought myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Okay. So this year we did something different with our teams. We sorted every student into one of three teams, Cobalt Commands, Earth Fluff, and Emerald Emu. Going forward, we will give incoming students, sixth graders, and new students a sorting place to place them in one of three teams. The sorting class asks fun questions like if you could make a potion, what would you make it for? Then, after they were sorted, students and teachers were sent a letter to welcome them to the team. Teams get points for kids demonstrating the traits, getting random aspects of spirit, and participating in spirit activities. Oh, and my mom was there with me. Oh. <laughs> What's your name? Oh, I'm Annie. Oh, I'm Nora. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Karina, my mom Nicole brought me, and I'm going to be talking about the monthly videos. So we make videos every month that announce the winning team, introduce the new traits, and do a drawing for random acts of spirit. We have a one minute video here with just some highlights of some of our videos. <laughs> Such as storage decorating, 
conquer the enemy. Online escape rooms and dance parties during lunch. In fact, we're having another really sweet on Friday. Gratitude three. And there's no picture of the gratitude yeah. band. Virtual escape room. Mm-hmm. Lunch time dance parties. <laughs> and Pumpkin bearing contest. Same with the door decorations contest. Yeah. Also, I'm Ariana. <laughs> <laughs> Ariana, do you have anybody to be introduced tonight? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so for Spirit Club, we do here at the before a lot of like holidays and stuff, or like before breaks. Um, a few of the photos here. I'm so great, yeah. <laughs> um, we have had anything about backpack day, which is a fan favorite. Um, everybody liked everything about backpack day. Um, we had a lot of like dress days, like Halloween, decade day, you know, jersey day, etc. Um, we have a teen color day every spirit week, and sometimes we just have plain ones like Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Spirit Club is only one of many clubs. Mr. Openstein is in charge of all the clubs. Most clubs are driven by student choice. Students with, students with ideas for a club seem to find a piece of sponsor to make their club happen. Uh, we usually have spirit club showing for change and homework club happening every year. And I'm Mia. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Claire. My mom got me. Um, and so I um, was in two of the sports this year, volleyball and track and they're always a lot of fun um because it's a way to like connect with students um uh outside of the costume and um, make connections that build inside of the costume and it's a really good way to like connect clubs and like in the costume and just like a fun way to make friends and also do sports and stuff so yeah it's really nice um but there's like a very wide variety of sports like volleyball, which I did, basketball, um, cross country, golf, wrestling, and track, which I did. <laughs> so, yeah, um, but it's always a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and um, here's Ms. Bob and Ms. Foxman talking about um, school and stuff. <laughs> 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 Hi, I'm Virginia Boston. Um, We're going to just look at academics using eighth grade English as a sample of academics, looking at where we've been, where we were this year, where we see ourselves going next. Uh, It was really nice to see the fifth graders, to hear from them what's happening at the fifth grade level. Um, because our students are going to change in what their conversations are, what the dialogue is, what they're comfortable with. And so having visibility to that, even for our sixth grade team, would be a really powerful tool to equip the to equip us at middle school to also build upon rather than start conversations. Um, Amber Wilde is my amazing new co-lead um, for eighth grade English and has taken a lead on what curriculum looks like now. This is my third year back in the classroom. After 15 years in corporate, I have had three different years of curriculum, this being the third. So um, without further ado, this is Mrs. Wild, and she's fabulous. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> I'm Ms. Foxton, I'm fabulous. <laughs> As eighth grade teachers in our language arts team, we focus on this theme of voice. And this has been consistent through these three years. 
this is how we updated it to this year. It's to hear and to understand voices of others so that I may better understand my own in order to be a voice of compassion and change. And so we've used this as our at the forefront of how we build, what we look to move towards, and how we think about the voices of our students and how we think about using our own voices as um, influence and impact on our students. Because what we say can do that. So we have to be mindful of it. Um, in English 8, where we have been, like I said, third year, three different things. Um, we focused on identity and voice. Um, our second unit was fear and oppression. We used night, Japanese relocation, World War II. Um, after that, we did a section on reader's workshop where students chose their own books. We focused from a reader's and writer's workshop perspective, reading teaching points, writing teaching points. Miss um, Wilde showed up this year and asked, so where are the common core standards? So we stepped away from RTPs and we stepped into standards-based learning and we readjusted the curriculum to do that so that our eighth grade students were graduating with those core standards being met, having an understanding of what those rubrics look like. And I'm taking your content, sorry. Um, unit three, voices of those perceived inferior. Well, unit four, voices of racism and injustice. Unit 4.2, literature circles focused around racism and injustice. Um, my takeaway, this is a, a dense slide to give you a one slide quick sh snapshot of all of the things that were involved in what we were doing. One of the things that was important in response to the pandemic and into being Common Core focused on our standards-based learning is that we had to talk about what was possible and we had to stop talking about what was depressing and hard and sad because those are always around us and we were in it too far and too much. And so um, here we are now. Um, this is you, Miss Wild. You get to take over and you get to talk. You push the buttons. I'll push the buttons. Um, I'm not as good at talking in front of adults as Virginia is, but I'll try my best. Um, so our focus on voice, uh, author's voice, so making sure that we understood where our books came from, the background of our authors, um, so that we can see their perception, um, what they're trying to tell, what the author's purpose is, character voice, so walking in their shoes, showing empathy, and then student voice, making sure that we heard those voices as much as possible. Um, so these were our six uh, main units of study. Um, so we started with identity and voice with the music project, um, trying to help students figure out what their identity and voice was based around the music and music lyrics, how they connected to those, why they chose that music. Um, then we went into the house on Mango Street as well. They read a book from a Latinx author that coincided with house on Mango Street and wrote um, Compare and Contrast Essays, so our first essay informational writing. Um, then we went into um, a fun unit called Voices of Creators, um, where they created creation stories, um, narrative writing around how the world was created. We tied in narrative, uh, Native American creation stories and creation stories from around the world um, in order to tie those all together for them to create their own and use those in their stories as well. Um, then we looked at voices of youth um, versus injustice. Um, so we looked more on how the youth can change the world rather than looking at the injustices. So trying to find the positive and the perspective um, rather than the downside. Um, there they did a lot of reflective writing. We also had a lot of um, Socratic seminars where they're able to argue back and forth and um, use information from their perspective as well as the books um, and research that they've done in order to have academic conversations with one another um, where we just kind of took yeah. the back seat and got to watch these conversations happen. Um, then we did Voices of Wisdom. Um, so we had students create fables um, that were published and now will be going into elementary school libraries. Um, these fables teach lessons to the younger students 
We're hoping that students will check these out so that they can see um, the leaders of Ross Valley and their voices. Um, and then we had just finished up Hope on the Rise, which is our poetry. Um, it used to be Yes Poetry, um, where they create a film project around their poetry, um, around either social justice, mental nice. health, or the environment. Um, and then our last unit that we've been working on that they're in now is about barrier breakers. Um, so they could choose any barrier breaker to do a culminating project around a biography as well as an argumentative essay um, to kind of keep their voices heard, keep student choice. Um, and that's kind of where we're yeah. ending the year for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> Everything highlighted in yellow is brand new built this year, brought by Amber or built from scratch, either together or with Amber taking the lead on it. So huge, huge accolades for the work there. Um, so these are some of the pictures just from the, these are the legacy books. So these are the ones that will go into at the elementary school libraries. Um, the Socratic seminar. So again, built in a circle, student led. Um, we didn't say anything, which is really difficult, um, but they led the circles. Um, and then the, this is the body biography that they're kind of um, doing now. We also led a lot of peer feedback with exemplars and rubrics that they could um, align. And the rubrics for essays are now CASP aligned, so we use the same ones that they're graded on throughout the years. Um, so that they have that consistency and know what those rubrics look like um, instead of it being a surprise. Um, yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, where we're going. But first, go back a step. Um, one of the things that both Amber and I have noticed this year, um, our students are emerging. Uh, this is the first year as a teacher that I haven't had to say, please be quiet on the first week of school. Yeah. Because our students are quiet. They aren't, they work, they work. They're better now. They're getting better now. <laughs> but I've never bad. had, especially in an eighth grade setting, students that don't want to talk to each other and that are happy to have their hoods up, their heads down, their mask on, and to not have to interact with each other. Maybe they're out of practice. It's um, definitely uh, an interesting year of transition as a human being. And sometimes you want to make those transitions in a private uh, safe space. And so now that we've asked them to be back out in public, it's our job to create a safe space for them still. Um, and to ask them to hear what it sounds like when their voice is out loud in the room and it's frightening. Um, and so the Socratic seminar for us to sit there and not save them by just letting the room be quiet and asking them to come forward and lead. It was really cool. I'd never done one of those before. I'd always wanted to, a little scared of it. And it was really, really cool to see them emerge. And they hated it too. <laughs> and the second time we tried it, they're like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. I can do this again. <laughs> so that practice has, has helped, I think, the students emerge as well. Um, where we are going, a couple things that we're still seeing um, is to continue to evolve and amplify the student choice and the student voice to bring our students forward with continued focus on mental health, on academic success, and on standard-based goals. Um, the students gave us some feedback. They'd like us to press further into modern authors. They would like more relevant texts. We definitely want to teach out of Jason Reynolds' texts next year. Um, more eyes on the text and so reading novels, um, more of that next year. Um, literature circles, building community within the classrooms, more student voices, their presentations. We had two this year. We definitely need to increase that moving forward. Um, for us, seeing the need and opportunity for student conferences, making them student-led, where the student identifies goals, works towards them, helps to advocate for what it is they need to accomplish those goals, making them SMART goals. And then from a district's consideration, our eighth grade students are terrible spellers. <laughs> so uh, they, they don't know their capitalization and their spelling as well as they could at this stage in their life. And we'll keep working hard at that too. <laughs> um, and I put it on a slide. But um, areas of strength, they are strong, exceptional readers. They love reading. 
The poetry creates writers when they don't see themselves as writers. They are excellent at creative writing, at narrative writing. They know that an essay is structured with five paragraphs, an intro and a conclusion. They are good at summarizing things and restating what the essay has already indicated. In contrast, this idea of commentary and expansion is still something that they are working towards attaining. Um, so I've put that over, we put that on the opportunities for growth, um, spelling we shared, proper capitalization, academic writing, and relevant evidence. These are areas where we just continue to do the work to help improve and strengthen and get them high school ready. Can we do it? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. All right. So the question I will uh, I ask our parents at back to school night is if it is this idea of voice is to hear and understand voices of others so that I may better understand my own in order to be a voice of compassion and change. How are we helping our students to find their voice, to understand their voice, to be agents of compassion and change? And are we communicating to our students that we are looking to support what they are capable of doing rather than helping them where they lack the ability to? And that is our we got them. Thank you all so very much. That was really enlightening um, to see all the fun activities that you all get to do at White Hill and then on the academic side in the eighth grade um, English classes. So extremely important and valuable. And I love that um, you didn't just come um, eighth grade teachers with just how you're doing and what you're doing well with, but you're also recognizing where you want to go and what you want to um, continue to adapt in your program to assist the students. So it's great to get this um, sneak peek into White Hill and really appreciate all of you for coming tonight. And we wanna do the same thing that we did with the Brookside students is have you all come up and get a picture with the board. Do you mind? Is it like, are you too old for that? Or are you okay? No. <laughs> oh, all right, that's right. All right. Teachers, and then, teachers, 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 come on, Maria, and teachers, come on up, and then, Teresa made these for you.
section which is uh, public comment now that the public has all wandered out of the building <laughs> except, for, except for one um, I don't is there any public comment on something not on our agenda no we do not have any public comment on that so we got board announcements it's only been a week what have you all been doing for the last week <laughs> is there any board announcements these are not the committee updates but just announcements yes, yes. Rachel what, what are I know I've been busy again um <laughs> Week. <laughs> I have a student who plays in the band at White Hill, and so they had their music festival competition in Milpitas on Saturday, so I drove down to watch them perform. Um, because I didn't know the timing of it really well, I kind of showed up, and I missed I missed one of the performances, or the performances for choir, but I got to see um, the jazz band, the orchestra, the concert band, and the symphonic band perform. So I was really proud of all the kids. Um, I'm really sad I missed choir because apparently they won first place. Wow. So kudos to them and to Miss Nicole. I was really, really pleased. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was a great event to see the kids performing, and, and there was a lot of competitions. So it was great. Awesome. Yeah. Any other announcements? Looking back and forth. All right. Um, and then correspondence communication to the board. I think, I think we have one item from. Last, last week, that, last week, yes, um, yep. continued. So okay. it's a longer exchange now, but it um, it was about the yellow bus transportation. Got system. it. Yep. Just want to make sure everybody had gotten a chance to see that correspondence um, on the agenda. And then we are can move on to our presentation and action items. So our first one is um, a recommended or an approval for a lease extension for the Fairfax and Summer Children's Center. And do we have a presentation? Yes, I think Chris is going to take this as a Marcidio. I am. Can, can we go ahead and get that? So uh, this evening we have uh, on the agenda a lease extension for the Fairfax Inn and Summit Children's Center. Okay. Uh, recently, the Fairfax Inn and Summit Children's Center contacted the district and inquired about extending the lease for four years. Uh, which was necessary for a facility grant opportunity they were interested in applying for. Um, as a re result of this request, I reached out to Terry Tao of Tao Rossini mm -hmm. uh, Law Firm. And Terry Tao has previously worked with the Ross Valley School District. Uh, and so Terry, uh, will, he, as he was working on this lease, um, we did want to have him available by phone this evening to discuss that lease um, of the site and to answer any questions. And I'm hoping we have him on the phone here. Um, no? I am on the phone. Oh, here we go. There Hi there, go. Terry. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I, I will just start with, uh, I'll give a quick introduction for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I've been practicing facilities law for about 30 years, uh, representing school districts up and down the state. Um, I am a licensed architect. And um, what I was asked to do was my understanding was on March 17th, there was a request to extend the current lease with the, uh, the San Anselmo Fairfax Child Care Center. And um, that lease extension was as a result of a um, infrastructure grant program, what's called SB 170, uh, that received two groups of funding, one under AB 131 and one under SB uh, 129. Uh, and this funding resulted in up up to $250 million worth of funding. The problem is the legislation has a number of strings tied to it, which required me to look at what it was that 
the requirements that the uh, California Department of Social Services would place on this lease, uh, since it's a lease to provide an infrastructure grant that would be essentially a modernization of the school over Deer Park. Um, I looked at your lease, which is a 1999 lease for 16 years. It extended to 2014. There is a lease extension from 2015 to 2019, a lease extension from 2019 to 2020. So since July 1st, 2020, this has been a month-to-month -month lease pursuant to Civil Code Section 1945. So in looking at this grant, require, the grant requirements which are going to apply, um, likely in the future. So my understanding is there was a small grant, and that small grant, uh, that time period uh, passed. Mm -hmm. uh, that grant closed on March 25th, 2022. So the original request made by Heidi Tomsky was on March 17th, 2022, about eight days before the March 25th, 2022 deadline. Not, not her fault. Um, for some reason, CDSS made the timeline really, really short. It was a February 7th uh, opening. Um, most people didn't learn about this grant until mid-February, late February. Uh, so there was not a lot of time for her to get over to the district and ask for the lease extension, which is why you're considering it now. Mm. My extent, my understanding is that this lease extension um, is also required for a future larger grant that has not yet been formed, but will be subject to the requirements of SB 170. So I'm going to go through those requirements and you're going to see why I'm a little concerned. So when I, <clears throat> when I went through the requirements, <clears throat> excuse me, of SB 170, there were a number of, re a number of critical program issues. One is um, that all program and services must meet disability access laws. That would be the ADA. It would be subject to civil rights laws, which would be the UNRU Act, which also applies the ADA. Then it requires compliance with all government code and public works construction requirements applicable to the project site, including application of labor code section 1720. And the last one is probably the one that's going to be most critical to you. That is that you need to meet all state and federal statutes and regulations, which means you need to meet field act, you need to meet building code, and you need to meet the local zoning regulations. So I made a couple of inquiries. <clears throat> Your property is an unusual property because it's what's called a flag lot. Uh, it's a lot that is actually not connected to anything. In fact, you your only access to this lot is across a Marin Municipal Water District easement. And when I made inquiry as to the requirements associated with this particular property, um, it has some unusual designations. The the General plan that's applicable for the town of Fairfax is public domain, which includes public schools. And the uh, the child care use would fall under a conditional use. It's also zoned for open area, which is essentially open space. The Structures that are built there meet all requirements that were applicable at the time that the construction occurred. But we made inquiry with Robert Bastion, the uh, Ross Valley Fire Department Senior Fire Inspector, about what would be required if you actually had to go through any modernization on the property. <clears throat> and his response was that the property was in a fire hazard zone, um, not fatal, but would trigger a number of requirements associated with access, fire alarms, 
water pressure sprinkler system, but probably your most significant one was the, uh, was the need to bring a fire hydrant to the site. And the closest fire hydrant is at Myrna Avenue. The other that looked like it was going to be very troublesome is for every building on site, the fire department was likely to require a 20 foot by 150 foot long lane for fire engine access. So not only would you be required to have access for each building, but you would also have to improve that easement that goes across the Marin Municipal Water District property uh, with a with a um, expanded road for fire engines. So when I looked at that, I started to become concerned that you're going to be subject to a number of that the child care center, if they decide that they want this grant and they decide that they want to do the improvement because of this four year extension requirement, they would then be subject to all of these upgrade requirements, fire, fire hmm. lane, expansion of the easement, which we uh, currently only own a limited size easement, it's 53 feet across, um, the bringing of a fire hydrant, um, the possibility of having to do fire sprinklers, um, and the need to meet ADA requirements. So I think that it's important to discuss with the child care, child care folks exactly what it is that they plan with regard to the property, because I'm not certain that they were planning on such an extensive upgrade. And I don't think that the district was planning for such an extensive, extensive upgrade. So I did want to make sure that you were aware of these requirements that would be triggered right away uh, if there was any form of modernization that was attempted on the the uh, school site. Um, so um, there were a number of other issues that I ran into, but these were the ones that looked most significant there were some other requirements associated with you know, interior upgrades, um, fire alarms, um, and the like. But uh, the more difficult ones are these associated with fire. With, with that, I don't believe that the extension makes sense un until or unless we have an understanding of what it is that's going to happen with regard to the building. With, with that, um, are there any questions? And I apologize for bringing you the bad news. Uh, I, I have a quick one. Um, can you, what, um, Terry, this is Marcy. Um, what triggers the need to do these? I, I missed that part. Um, um, there are, <clears throat> under the grant, the grant is supposed to um, be funding for improvements to the property. So this okay. is the Deer Park mm -hmm. property. Yeah. And once you are triggered into doing the improvements and the requirements comply with law, we made inquiries oh. with um, the city. And the city's response was um, that there were a number of fire-related upgrades that oh. are required for the property. Okay. The most significant of which are the expansion of the fire road, bringing the fire hydrants, and then um, the establishment of locations for fire trucks against the buildings. Okay, thank you. So it's the improvements that trigger the trigger these, okay. It, it is the improvements. As of right now, you fall under what's called Government Code Section 830.6, uh, I'm sorry, 930.6, which is uh, a compliance with field act requirements for the building at the time when it mm. was built. So the moment that you start to mm. um, do additions or make changes to the building, then you're going to trigger a number of new requirements. Okay. okay. Um, Marie here can I ask a question? So is it a little bit like uh, when you have an old home, which is my case, I have an old house of 100 years old, I'm okay until I do a renovation. And then because I do renovation, I need to install fire alarm and fire stuff in my house. So if I don't do anything, I'm okay. But if I start 
upgrading, then st- I, I need to get up to code, right? It's a little bit like that. You are absolutely right. It's okay. a lot like that. Oh, then that's um, a big deal. With uh-huh. school, see, with your home, sometimes the city can come to you and say, you need to do these things. With schools, it's a little different. With schools, you actually typically don't have to do much at all because of the application of Field Act. Yeah. It's the additional work that automatically tr- triggers a whole bunch of upgrade requirements. So that sounds like uh, it, it seems to me that I heard a couple of uh, items such as likely likely to to ask access. It, it seems to me that there is a little bit of more homework that needs to be done. I do, I do, don't think we are, I, I'm not ready to recommend anything uh, one way or the other. It seems that we need to investigate a little bit more, right? Yeah, I mean, this I would highly recommend okay. some discussion with the child care center. Okay. Uh, I'll give you another example in the grant so that you know. Um, when I was looking at the legislation, even with the uh, March grant that ended up, that closed on March 25th, Mm -hmm. Um, They had a requirement that the project be shovel ready, which meant that the um, child care center actually needed to have the plans uh, previously approved by the, by, in this case, DSA, Division of State Architect. Um, I don't think that they had anything in the works at the time, Uh, so I'm not sure it would have been shovel ready, but there was an outside requirement, too, that applied, which was all construction needed to be completed by June 30th, 2023. And remember, that's yeah. with the prior grant. Yeah. <laughs> this, there will be a new grant that has not been established yet. Yeah. And it looks like what they're requiring is everything be constructed within one year, immediately following grant funds being provided. Okay. 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 And <laughs> I know year. from my conversation with Heidi, the types of things they were hoping to do under that um, grant that was uh, available in March um, was some asphalt paving and the roof um, is my memory. I don't have my notes with me in here this evening, um, but that's that's uh, my memory. So given that, I just want to be sure in moving forward and in, in talking with um, Heidi at the Children's Center is it doesn't... Um, it, it doesn't matter what type of improvements, mm-hmm. it triggers the automatic mm-hmm. upgrades based on whatever government code is in place today. Yeah. Is that what I'm hearing? With asphalt paving, by the way, yeah. um, it's not as simple as most people think. Okay. There's actually a division of state architect um, interpretive regulation. I think it's either interpretive regulation 20 or interpretive regulation 22. Um, that particular regulation says that if you decide that you're going to do a um, re-asphalt job, you're required to go to DSA and get ADA clearance. So all parking lot asphalt work will need to meet the requirements of the ADA. So that would mean you would have to provide the right number of handicap stalls, you would have to provide the right number of van spaces, and you would need to make sure that um, none of those and the walkways um, all meet ADA requirements, which means you know no more than certain slopes, no more than two percent cross slopes. All right. Um, okay. So, so this grant I, alone triggers DSA, or is it the type of work that triggers DSA? The, both. both. The type okay. of work okay. will trigger yeah. DSA. And the grant also triggers DSA. Okay. So it sounds like in looking into a lease extension, there's just a lot more information that uh, has come to light. Um, You know, I agree. I certainly am not prepared to make a decision tonight other than to direct staff to go and make sure that we collect comprehensive information of what we need to connect with the child care center um, and to figure out kind of next steps on this arena um, in order to make sure that we have all the information that we need um, given what you've what you found with this preliminary um, look. So and can I ask one quick question? Terry, this is Chris. Um, you had mentioned something about uh, 
requirements with the, uh, the city or the town of uh, Fairfax as well, potentially because of the zoning? Um, that is correct. Are there any, I, I know we have DSA and normally DSA, we don't have to go back to the town planning department, but is, did I understand that, that we would have to then coordinate those two? Or is, does yes. DSA still it, override it? It gets a little bit um, more complicated um, because, because of the location of the site and what the uses are. Uh, you typically will be required to pull what's called, uh, you'll have to get all of your local approvals and the city or the local jurisdiction, the Fairfax, would have uh, oversight over drainage, grading, and traffic, all three of which you have some issues with, mm -hmm. as well as clearance on fire. So those four requirements uh, fall under Government Code Section 53097 uh, and will be applicable regardless of the fact that DSA has overall responsibility, mm -hmm. but the city will be able to exert influence over those four requirements. And remember, the child care center is not considered a school use. So it's going to have a conditional use permit um, hmm. under that uh, the zoning for OA, which is open space, and the uh, general plan designation of PD. So that conditional use will impose all the additional requirements that are specific to the um, town of Fairfax. Hmm. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. There any? I mean, also like I also heard the easement with the marine municipal, marine municipal water. water. So it, it seems it seems it seems a kind of form that probably worth opening, yeah. but certainly uh, we are opening in yeah. There's a lot of questions I have here. So I guess we'll. Yeah. I mean, it, not having any of like the study. reports and all of that yeah. kind of stuff. It sounds like that's uh, you know. Directing to get, staff yeah. to go ahead yep. and, and continue yeah. the work that it sounds like you started, started yeah. to mm -hmm. gather the rest of the information and then bring it back to us um, based on what you found, mm -hmm. following up with the child care center. Um, Absolutely. I, I would agree with all of you. I think that, uh, and I truly apologize, uh, um, given I've been traveling and I, um, uh, I looked at this and realized right away that there was an issue. Uh, I apologize for bringing it to you here. Normally, I would prepare uh, a little bit more comprehensive memo. I wouldn't have ordinarily kind of surprised you with this. Um, but I just made it back from Europe. Uh, uh, and I wanted to make sure that uh, you had this information. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to uh, sit down with the um, San, Anselmo, San Anselmo Fairfax Child Care Center and go over some of the things that we found. Uh, so that they're um, able to see what it is that I'm seeing. And um, I think that that would um, give them a better idea of what's going on. I'm, I'm afraid that some of the uh, items that will be triggered just because of the age of your building mm -hmm. will um, be rather costly to deal with. And it may not be as simple as, you know, even if you got, say, a um, million dollar grant, um, my impression is that most of the million dollars will be tied up. In fact, all of the million dollars will likely be tied up with these requirements that will get triggered. Okay. okay. I, that would Let's be talk great, about. Terry, um, if Chris and I could talk with you later and then set up a meeting. Um, because whatever questions um, Heidi may have from the center, um, it would be great because we probably wouldn't be able to answer them ourselves. So that would be fantastic. We'll get in touch with you mm -hmm. um, following the meeting tomorrow. Okay. And then bring it, right. and then when, whatever you all yep. work on, bring it back to the board. Absolutely. So we can share that with us. Yep. All right. Thank all right. you, everybody. And I apologize thank for dropping uh, on thank you. at the last minute. Okay. Thank all right. Thank you. you. We'll, we'll okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. So as we are not making a uh, recommendation to approve, do we, how do we conclude this? Well, I think we need to just be sure there are any other questions that yeah. are brought to public for public comment yeah. okay. and then bring it back up to the board. So looking at a public comment, we don't have any other yeah. one, person. Got one person here, but no, yeah, one person no question. here, but no public comment. Um, 
and bringing it back to the board then, because it was a possible action or vote item. But if there's yeah, no that's why I was asking about the procedure, but if we're not vote. It doesn't seem that we're if voting no one way or the other, second, right? Then okay, it, got then it. Directed staff. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nope. And, yeah, just correct. That would mean that a chance. you're not taking action this evening, and um, staff will go back. Um, Talk more with Terry Tao yeah. to fully understand and also, of course, share the information and meet with um, representatives, um, Heidi or anybody else from Fairfax and Selma Children's Center to share. And then we'll be coming back um, here to you as soon as we have more information. Okay. And uh, we don't have a meeting next week. Okay. <laughs> so it won't be three weeks in a row, but we do have another one at the end of the month, May 31st. Okay. So that would be the soonest um, that we would be coming back. Okay. Okay. All right. Looking at my colleagues here, and no is, action. That, is, is everybody in agreement? Yeah, yes. Okay. Can we that? Um, all right. Then we will move on to the second presentation and action item, which is um, a window into RBSD focus on math. Yeah. Is that you, Julia? That is me. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge our public here is Karen Tessator, who is a longtime math teacher at White Hill Middle School and a leader in our mathematics work. And she'll be chiming in a couple of times over the course of the presentation um, because she's she's the action that's right in there. Um, we just so, pencil. ready? No pencils. Gosh, <laughs> no paper. Please take a moment and think about this problem. And as you come to a solution, really watch what did you do, because that's the important part mm -hmm. to reach that solution. And I'll just give you a little bit of think time here. And I'll also recognize that whenever, particularly, we do mathematics with adults, mm -hmm. there are different responses within a room, and they are feeling-based responses. And something that we know about, um, not just in, in the United States, but really everywhere, mm -hmm. is this kind of idea of a mathematics culture and an idea of who belongs and who does mathematics belong to? And so there are some people who enter the, a, a mathematics space feeling like it belongs to them. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who don't enter it in that way. And in Ross Valley, we're really working to create a culture, a mathematics culture, an environment where all students feel that sense of belonging. Um, so anybody want to share how they got their answer. I'm much more interested in how you got your answer than I am in your actual answer. I took a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm one of those people who does not see math as my space. Mm -hmm. I definitely had a feeling response. I was like, oh, panic. But then I remembered like the internet and like Facebook and where they're like, hey, if you take the 15% and you flip 98% of 15, you could do it that way. Or you could do 100 and then 15 and then like back it down. So those are the two ways I thought of it. I still don't have an answer. I think it's 14, but I'm not sure. <laughs> the panic response. But that's how I would do it if I had pen and paper. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? All right. I just estimate. And come close enough where I'm close enough to the number. If it's multiple choice, and it's close to that number. That's going to be my guess. What's your estimate? Well, it's, it's above 14, and it's below 15, and it's more closer to the higher end of 15 because 98 is closer to the higher end of 100. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing a high 14%. What about 14.7? <laughs> Why do you think that? I was doing an estimate in my head as well, or maybe it's not an estimate. I was thinking 15% uh, of 100 is is, um, is 15, therefore it's uh, 1.5. So I was going to my kind of, it's it's 15 or, or 1.5 or 0 0.15. 
and I multiplied that by two because of his, um, you know, his two point between 98 and 100. So I was kind of doing like that in my head. He's in a distributive property. This is a word I was absolutely thinking about. This be <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I know you're... Mine is 15% of 100 and then 15% of two. Mm-hmm. And then what do you do with those two numbers? You subtract the 15% of two. Sean, you looked like you wanted to... 10% of 98 and uh-huh. half of that. Oh, clever. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I just remembered about putting words into symbols. So whenever I see what, I put a question mark. Mm-hmm. And whenever I see is, I put an equal sign. And of is a multiplication sign. So I was thinking oh of it like, what would this sentence look like in math symbols? And the language of mathematics is that math is a language, and it's really important to teach that language. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is what we call a math talk. I mean, it's a very straightforward problem, and it's to get your thinking going. And every person who spoke showed mathematical thinking. Um, and then just recognizing all the different ways. But when Sean said it, I, I understood Sean's way the fastest. <laughs> it was like once, clear. once, once that came out, yeah. that's, that was the right answer. I yeah. just didn't come to it. That was, no, that, was, that, that, was, that was how I would have figured out the next one using that. Method. Well, look at all of the lovely. Look at that. Answers. Look at the answer. Yeah, yeah. I said Sean was right. And so, hearing <laughs> Sorry, Sean's man. solution, if you were to have a similar problem tomorrow, yeah, you might how, actually take you to a quicker yeah. pathway, exactly, yeah. and that's a part of that math talk as well. Um, and then, you know, we talk about that standard algorithm, which is another say, way of saying, at least if you're in my age range, like the way that we learned it, <laughs> right? And here's the standard algorithm for multiplication of a, um, with a percentage. Um, and the difficulty with the standard algorithm often is, is, A, there's a lot of mathematics in there that is not understood, of the why. Why is that where the decimal point is? What does that 490 represent? What was the, what does the 980 represent? Why are we moving the decimal two places? Um, so really needing to have those experiences with students where they're understanding a concept before they hit that standard algorithm. And the other thing to recognize about, about these kinds of problems is the really complicated math problems, we all use a calculator. You know, they used to joke, someday everybody will have a calculator in their pocket, right? And now we do. It's called a phone. Um, And I always like to say, math is greater than computation. You know, computation is a very small subset of mathematics. Okay. So this is Ms. Pallariti who teaches third grade at Brookside, and she's leading a math talk. And so you'll see what this looks like in a third grade classroom. Have you had a really interesting idea? She said, I can come up with a really rough if you can do this. She said, I can do four 50 times. Um, Would you agree with the statement, I can do that in a not as a shoot party? Yeah. Yeah. So Abby and Anna also said, what if we did 54 times? You think that would be better? Yeah. yeah. I also heard 50 plus 50. Yeah. And then double that. Yeah. Yeah. This is the other way that I mix a way that you talked about with the term. Eli, I was wondering if you did that. Five times four is twenty. Maybe I don't know. And extra place value? Yeah. Hundred. Then what was the number? I I don't think that five. So then I might be ridiculous. Okay. Abby, what was your way? Fifty plus 
So you witnessed a whole bunch of teacher moves that helped to create that sense of math belonging there. The kids began with their own, you didn't see this part, but just some personal think time. And then they did a turn and talk so that they could discuss <coughs> their answer and listen to each other and engage in that discourse. And while that was happening, the teacher very skillfully was moving around the classroom and listening in and listening for some solutions that she knew would be out there. Um, so she's actually being really smart because these things can go on and on and on because everybody wants to share their solution. Karen's mm -hmm. nodding because she's very familiar with this. Um, and so her ability to say, oh, you know, she had a response that wasn't efficient and here's what it was. And that's one of the things we try to do when we have all these multiple solutions. A conversation that we have is, well, what's a more efficient way of solving this problem? And that actually tends to get you to the next level of mathematics. Mm -hmm. All right. Is that a whole thing? Okay. So something that we know has been coming and has been guiding our work in Ross Valley this year is the California Math Framework. Um, it is due out in July. Well, it's due to go to the California Board of Education for adoption in July. It's been out for quite some time now, really for a couple of years in multiple draft forms. And um, I think in about a week, this final public comment period is going to, going to come to a close. But I think it's important to understand what a framework is as opposed to a set of standards. So the framework offers guidance for implementing the content standards. The standards are what it is that you teach and the framework is how you teach it. Mm -hmm. um, and it describes the curriculum and instruction, that should say necessary, not unnecessary. <laughs> to help students achieve proficiency. Um, it talks about the design of instructional materials. So you'll have your set of content standards, you'll have your framework, and now we will probably begin to see new instructional materials coming out that are in alignment with the framework. Um, and then they have a lot to do with our with professional development as well. So it's, it's the how. And to that end, we've had some of our teachers, kind of our math leads, attending some conferences this year and working towards understanding of this new framework that's going to be coming our way. Um, so in March, we brought a team of five third through fifth grade teachers, one of our MTSS partners, one of our principals went, I went, and we went to Stanford University to work with Joe Bowler for two days. Um, and the content of this particular work, workshop was really around teaching through big ideas, which mm -hmm. is one of the big ideas of the California State Framework. Um, and other things that we talked about was that every class is heterogeneous and that we need to always be mindful that we have a very wide range of learners within our mathematics classrooms. Um, and one of the ways that we differentiate for that is by offering what we call low floor high ceiling tasks. So these are tasks that are um, appropriate for all kids. All kids can, that's that low floor, right? All kids can step into the task, but the task has space um, for kids to grow. And I think about that like a really simple language arts, low floor, high ceiling task is write about your summer. Mm -hmm. Because any one of us in this room right now could yeah. really stretch ourselves mm -hmm. by writing about our summer. That's a low floor. Right. And I can be a first grader and write about it. And I can be, you know, a graduate student in a creative arts college. Um, so that's that high ceiling. And it's it's a little bit more complex finding those kinds of tasks mm -hmm. for mathematics. But that's a big part of what we're trying to do right now. And those are the kinds of tasks that tend to create more engagement for students. Um, and then again, this idea of teaching through big ideas. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but this is this comes from a document um, that's being published alongside the framework. And again, Dr. Joe Bowler, um, professor at Stanford, she's a professor of mathematics education, and she's she's really well known for her growth mindset work um, in mathematics. 
but she was one of the people who worked on this document. Um, and the circles that you see are the big ideas and the lines show the connections to the other big ideas. Mm. So the more lines, the bigger the circle because it's a more connected um, area. And then the chart that you see next to it shows on the right side of those colors, the standards, the content standards that would be linked together as a part of that big idea. All right. And then middle school has really taken a big dive this year. And we've done a lot of work. Um, and I realized I actually missed one of the trainings that we did isn't on here because we also went to MCOE for that day. Right? Um, so lots of things that we've done. We did teaching heterogeneous groups with Joe Bowler. And this idea, again, that every, um, every classroom is heterogeneous. Even when it's a tracked classroom, it's still heterogeneous, right? Um, and that was a one day at Stanford University. Um, we had a day with Fawn Wynn, who is just a fantastic mathematics educator. She's taught middle school mathematics for a long period of time and is now a coach and leads trainings all over the country. Um, we're super lucky, lucky to have her in Marin County. Um, and we worked with her for one day. The whole math department has attended these. And then following that, we've had two release days. And the focus of those release days is how to put all of this that we've been taking in into practice. Mm -hmm. um, but Karen, if you feel, if, if you're willing, just maybe to talk a little bit about changes in the classroom and what we've been practicing since attending these experiences. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, first, I'd like to start by saying the release time we get to do these things is so critical and it costs the district money because we have to pay for stuff. So we really so appreciate mm -hmm. this time. It's super important um, for us to collaborate together as a department and be able to talk to each other about these things. How are we gonna implement it, get ideas from each other? So that part, just thank you for allowing us to have that. Um, it's kind, it was kind of interesting because the framework and um, is really getting around with um, the new framework with, and the uh, time with Joe Boulder was getting around we're getting away from tracking is the idea mm -hmm. is that ultimately we want to get away from tracking and what was really powerful about that day was seeing data that shows that that is the best the best learning happens that the high kids are still just as challenged they do as well but what really is powerful is those kids that see themselves not as math learners really grow so that was fantastic to see that and then kind of embrace that idea of, that we need to be thinking about that in all of our classes um, the, with Fawn Nguyen, what was really the big takeaway was you need to do a lot of problem solving. We don't do enough problem solving. We do kind of tasks mm -hmm. that are directly related to our curriculum, but we don't really engage in problem solving enough. And so one of the big takeaways is she does some kind of a problem solving task every day as the warm-up as the students come in. And so a lot of us at White Hill have implemented this. Um, there's this great site called Stella's Stunners um, that has all these problems and you just every day I'm going and I'm searching and finding oh this one today and the thing that's been really powerful about those is I'm looking for problems that don't have calculation math in them. Mm. They're more like logic puzzles, visual mm. puzzles mm -hmm. and what it's allowed to happen is it's changed the culture like I, the kids have to come in at least in my room and they have to come in silently sit down and just work on their own, some own their own think time <laughs> and it's really kind of it's not a high pressure thing because they know we're going to go over it later. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get some time to turn and talk and then we share out the ideas kind of similarly to the video you saw as many different ways as we can because what we're really trying to encourage them to see is there are multiple ways of seeing the same problem. Um, and the really, really exciting part about it is those kids that do the quick calculations and get fast answer all the time, they're often not the kids that are getting these problems. The kids who are getting these problems are the ones that a lot of times don't have a lot of math confidence. And these are so different than what they think math is. They're really open to trying them. So you're getting the voice of students who aren't necessarily seeing themselves as the math stars mm -hmm. in the classroom. So that's been super powerful. Um, and you know, sometimes there's a little competition who can figure it out a different way. And um, it's great to challenge kids that do get things quickly. It's like, great, what's another way? Find another way now. Um, because most of these puzzles do have multiple ways that you can solve them. A lot of them have many solutions. I did one that had 
92 solutions because the kids were all kind of struggling. It was it's called eight queens, and anyway, it's on a chessboard. You're trying to put eight queens so that none of them can run into each other. And the kids were working on it, and they, some of them were getting frustrated. I don't know how to do this. I can't get there. And I said, well. I said, do you want to know how many solutions there are? And they're like, okay. And I said, 92. There are 92 different solutions. You can, so find you one. can keep working. We can maybe find one. So, but it is that kind of challenge because they're like, wait, 92? How can it? And it just gets them going. So that's been super exciting. And then the last piece is in this building thinking classrooms. Um, uh, there's a book that we're reading, and I can't even remember his name right now. Like that year, I Peter Lillen something. Lillen, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm not the only one who doesn't remember that. This would feel a little better. Um, but what it was is they did some research and they found that if kids were put into random groups every period, every day, they got put into random groups, totally random, not teacher manipulated, mm -hmm. literally pulling a stick or pulling a card out of a deck. Groups of three, no more than groups of three. And then they stand at a whiteboard. They're not with a paper and pencil at a desk, they're actually standing at a whiteboard um, working out problems. The results of the engagement were just so phenomenal in the research and um, so I am in the, and so the other thing is it, it, to do this you need a lot of whiteboard space so Whitehill we're very fortunate in the new buildings we have those beautiful walls yes. the whiteboard walls that can close and open but it leaves a lot of space and so one of the things that you do to create some more whiteboard space is you defront the classroom which means that there's not really the front of the classroom that is noticed this is the place where the teacher delivers instruction what is happening now is that you're kind of shaking things up. Um, I've moved like my agenda board to like the middle of the room, kind of hidden by the doorway. I've taken almost everything off the whiteboard and I'm getting ready next week to just really implement this daily change with these activities. Um, there's, it requires some planning because it, there's only groups of three, we're kind of set up with groups of four, so I'm having to kind of manipulate some things in the classroom. But I'm super, super excited to try this um, because one of the things is by shifting groups randomly, very frequently, it builds a lot of equity of, of voice in the classroom. And so I'm super excited. I kind of wish we could have started this sooner because we're at the end of the year right now. So um, anyway, so that's what we're working on um, right now and really hoping to do a little bit of experiment experimentation in the spring here so we learn from it and so that we can really start in the fall with these ideas and it's just super exciting to just see how it's building into our equity of voice work in our classrooms um, and I'm really excited about it. So again, thank you for these opportunities. It helps us all become better educators um, by getting all these opportunities to learn and grow. So super excited to be yeah. implementing all this. Thank you for letting me have a moment or two. Oh, no, thank <laughs> you. It's great to hear from you and hear, you know, what's been fabulous about these trainings is that they've really been, and now try this in your classroom, and yeah. they're, you know, well-researched kind of teacher moves that you can, you know, implement that have a big impact on kids. And like even, like truly this, this idea of the random groupings and it's visible random groupings, because middle school kiddos, they don't believe you when you say, I randomly set up the seating chart. They're like, uh-huh, yeah, we know, you know, you're never going to put me with my friend over here or... But to show that every day, you know, that you trust that every kid in this class can work with every other kid in this class um, is really powerful. So we're excited. Yeah, and Fawn, great. who is so amazing, has agreed to come back to Marin County for um, three days next week, next year. And so our work will continue to be focused around our work with Fawn. And we have this book read that we're doing, Building Thinking Classrooms. Um, and this slide comes from Fawn, just this idea of we have an imbalance in our school mathematics in that there's so much focus on the procedural um, and the routine exercises and just not enough on the routine tasks. And then this one comes from, anybody is welcome to tell me how to pronounce that last name, Peter Lilladal. Lilladal? 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 Anyways. Know. He's fabulous. <laughs> and he did um, a research project where he went into 10 different classrooms and where teachers were giving kids problems to solve and studied what kids were doing when they were given a problem to solve. And this chart shows, generally speaking, over the, you know, across all of these classrooms, what kids were doing. And you had kids who were slacking, basically, doing something else, looking at their cell phone, whatever. 
um, kids who are stalling, and you see this a lot in a classroom, kids who are uncertain about their mathematics, mask it. And they're doing all kinds of things like, oh, you know, looking up like they're thinking or writing something as if it's solving a problem when really they're not doing their math thinking in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, those are the fakers, actually, I guess. The staller, oh, the stallers are the, I got to go sharpen my pencil. I got to go to the bathroom. I need a piece of paper. <laughs> like, I'm just not going to get going. Um, and then a lot of kids do what we kind of tell them to do, which is mimicking. And basically, we have a worked solution. Here's a multiplication problem. Here's how you solve a multiplication problem. Now I'm going to give you a problem exactly like that one. And you're going to do exactly what I just did. And I love his use of the word there of mimicking, because that's not really engaging their mathematical thinking. And then the category of tried to solve the problem, whether they got it right or got it wrong, but really engage themselves in that math thinking, you can see is that six out of whatever that whole number, probably six out of 30. Um, so really interesting to think about what are kids actually doing when we think we've taught and everybody's working on the problem. Hmm. And then another piece, this is from Fawn in her worksheet workshop with us of just making sure that you are asking thinking questions. So here's um, an example that has to do with area and perimeter of a rectangle. And so really straightforward, this is what we're used to. We know what to do. You're gonna multiply up its area. Yeah. You're gonna add all the sides of its perimeter. <laughs> Very different if you ask students to draw two rectangles so that the first one has a larger perimeter but a smaller area than the second. Boy, that seemed, yeah. Very different, yeah. but the same skill. You still need to understand area and perimeter. You still need to use the same procedures, but much more thinking. And then another level, draw two rectangles so that the first one has exactly twice the perimeter but half of the area of the second. And so really, we call that depth of knowledge, right? So this is much higher DOK depth of knowledge, asking thinking questions and incorporating more problem solving and really bringing into that balance and having those non-routine tasks that aren't necessarily computation-based that are getting that mathematical thinking going. All right, back to the framework. It's due out in July. There's been a lot of public comment on the framework. One of, the, um, one of the criticisms was that um, there are people who are concerned that the focus of the framework, a big focus is around equitable instruction, and they are worried that some students won't be challenged. And so there's been a lot that's been added to mm. the framework to address that concern. Um, core ideas of the framework that learning and performance are enhanced when there is communication between different areas, different brain areas, that visual and spatial um, activities are a really important part of learning mathematics. Um, the use of open, authentic, multi-dimensional tasks um, that use math ideas that are not only through numbers. We've been talking about that. And that students learn best when they look at how concepts are connected to one another, and that's that big idea piece. This is, I don't know, I, people who write frameworks and things come up with like really complex visuals, but uh, yeah. <laughs> you you this one, here. <laughs> the first column there, <laughs> math teachers, all teachers of math are very familiar with those. Those are our math practices, uh -huh. and that's how you do mathematics. Right, so you need to model with mathematics, use appropriate tools, pay attention to accuracy, um, look at your look at your reasoning, that sort of thing. The swirls in the middle are the why. Why do we do math? It's that question that comes up in middle school. Um, we use mathematics to make sense of the world, to predict what might happen. Um, and to impact the future. So that's the, those big whys. And then down there at the, at the bottom is also the, um, the what. What are the different things that we will be doing? So um, we look at shape and space and putting things together and pulling <coughs> things apart um, and exploring changing quantities and communicating with data. Data science, huge part of the framework. 
huge shift in the state of California. UC is now, now accepting a data science course in replacing an algebra, advanced algebra or algebra two course, um, which is a super, super yeah, big deal and a recognition of the importance of data science. I can speak as a mom of two young kids whose both of their jobs are data science and they did not have data science when they were um, in school. So this is a really um, weighty and meaty slide around mm -hmm. equity in the, in the mathematics framework. And this comes directly from the CDE website. They have math framework FAQs. Um, so the aim of the framework is to respond to the structural barriers put in the place of mathematics success. Equity influences all aspects of the document. Some overarching principles are that all students deserve powerful mathematics. Something that we've seen time and time again is that when kids struggle in math, we pull them out and we give them math that is not engaging, that doesn't ignite critical thinking, all those things that pull us into mathematics. So all students deserve powerful mathematics. And that can be cultivated, that the ability to, to do mathematics is available to everyone. Um, Student engagement needs to be a design goal of mathematics. We want our kids to love math. Um, and that cultural backgrounds and experiences and language are assets. They are resources for learning mathematics. And that's a part of that equitable instruction. Um, and that kind of is the last bullet as well, that all students are capable of mathematics, regardless of their background, their language of origin, their differences, their foundational knowledge, all are capable of, our, of mathematics. And then there has been a lot of talk about middle school math. So the framework has so much in it, but the conversation is around um, pathways in the middle school. Much of the conversation is around that and kind of the race to calculus and whether kids are gonna to get to calculus in 12th grade and will they have to double up in, in high school and that sort of thing. So here's where we are at the moment. Um, with, with our thinking. And when I say our, it's it's myself, it's Marcy, it's our math teachers at White Hill, it's Principal Matt Katanzarit. Um, and we've all been engaged with all of the districts within the county. We're having these meetings where we're all coming together and having this conversation. And some districts have made some changes. Mm -hmm. um, and here's where we are. So we in Ross Valley and at White Hill are, are committed to providing engaging, challenging instruction for all of our students through incorporating more problem solving into our instructional program, through identifying and implementing those low floor, high ceiling tasks that engage all of our learners and creating a learning environment that maximizes success for all students and where all students feel a sense of belonging. We are committed to providing equitable access to accelerated pathways through multiple options for students. And so in recognition that our practice has been and currently is that at the end of a student's sixth grade year, they're placed either in Math 7 or Math 7A. Mm -hmm. And we are looking for ways that, that kids <coughs> can demonstrate readiness for algebra through multiple different, through different ways um, and bringing more kids in. Recognizing that some kids at the end of sixth grade are in a very different place than they are at the end of seventh grade. Middle school kids change a lot. And we're looking for readiness in our students. We're looking for an understanding of standards and also just the desire from the point of view of the student to move forward um, with their mathematics. Okay. Um, at this point, we do not have any plans to eliminate algebra as an option. We are looking at finding ways to make seventh grade more heterogeneous, again, with those pathways for students who see themselves as someone who might want to accelerate and take algebra in the eighth grade. And that, I was in Chicago th this weekend visiting my daughter, and we went to the Chicago <coughs> Museum. Institute of Art, and there was a whole fabulous exhibit by oh. this, this, oh my gosh, do you know him? No, but that looks like this, my style. I love it. It's, you have to. Yeah. It's so good. Wait, his I'm name just, is Mel Bachner. Oh. And 
it was unbelievable. But anyway, so I need to get that for my measurement office. on this one, and I had to throw it in there. It was so excited. beautiful. Um, so, <laughs> opening up to the board in public, anything? Or to the board, I should say. Great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing some of your thinking on, on where they're going. Sounds exciting and a lot to be continued. Like the, the figuring out all of that moving forward seems both exciting as well as like, okay, make that work. So I appreciate kind of getting this preview of Absolutely. where you're headed to know what that looks like. I like the inclusion level that there's different methods to get to the answers and that the answers aren't just memorizing the times table booklets and coming up with the answer and putting it out there. When you ask kids to show their work, it can still come about getting the answer in a different way that is still right and still encouraged. And I like to, you know, sometimes we all get as adults locked in our fashion and our music, but math, it seems, is kind of growing into a different realm of inclusion. And I like the idea of people all stepping into the room and all being able to find the right problems and all, if you if you get the problem first, great, go get it a different way. So that person can still be learning and challenged as the person who's just in the bottom floor, just really trying to get it right, but the inclusion. And I, I really like hearing about what you do with the classroom because mm -hmm. I, th I think that the, the environment is so challenging to start with with kids this age. And it's really nice to go into those open houses and see how things are being done differently than it was when I was a mm -hmm. child. And seeing that the kids engage at a different level. And also, I, I personally, I love the idea of funding for specialists to go to see other specialists mm -hmm. to understand different ways of bringing new ideas to the same old problems and i think that that's really worthwhile i, I don't i don't think that the 30th year of the teacher in the classroom should be giving the 30th exercise that, she, that he or she gave 30 years ago because that's how it was taught so you know growing as adults and teachers also encourages children, in my opinion, to grow and learn even in a short period of time as they change at that level. So I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. And that's something that Matt and I have been remarking on is that we have a math department at White Hill that is so open to all of this work and willing to try things out and take risks. And, and Matt's created an environment where teachers feel that they can do that. And so we're really happy about that. Yeah, nice report. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You have... I <coughs> ended up in applied mathematics, who would have thought? <laughs> but um, do you have, speaking of applied mathematics, do you ever have uh, parents or professional, you know, people come in, like, I'm thinking of like, especially in sixth grade, because I remember getting asked like, when do you ever, when are you ever going to use this mom in real life kind of thing, right? And so, yeah, I was just thinking like in sixth grade, your kids see lots of different people in all kinds of professions and places that they never would have thought would have been using math, talking about how they are using math, whether that might, I don't know if you do any of that in sixth grade to kind of... It's something I, I think we need to do more of, but I, I think we're getting better at bringing in and showing all different kinds of people that are mm -hmm. using mathematics, yeah. and, um, but it's a really broad, diverse group of folk that are... This, the ones that are spearheading that work. But I think more and more in, in kind of all areas, making those connections for kids to what people are doing with with this knowledge is really important. And it might be easier, too, with Zoom now, where we oh, can yeah. have folks, they don't have to even be physically in the classroom. They can yeah. just be on the screen for the kids. There was a if career to have day last year mm. Um, mm. With, where a lot of kids Zoomed in, yeah, graduates. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice report. I like, I like to hear the different ways of uh, engaging with students in math because I, I was a non-math person and I worked in finance and numbers and I did data scientist myself after that, but it was definitely a late blooming and I, I, was, I didn't belong. Mm -hmm. I thought I didn't belong in the math class. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and that, that was sad. And uh, when I'm hearing that you are outreaching to the students who have potential, but just they may not like the traditional way of doing the math. They may not be good at computation, although I got the 14.7 correct, so kind of I got something right. But it's definitely math was not engaging, and what you are teaching is engaging. 
what I'm hearing is that. So, yeah, good job, good job, very exciting, love it. Thank you. Out of math, after yeah. all. It's interesting because I have, I have an eighth grader at White Hill, and so I think I think actually we have two in the yeah. same math class in this in this room right now. But um, yeah, it's interesting when there's homework and it's like, hey, mom, I need help with your homework. I'm like, okay, explain to me how they told you how to do this in class, <laughs> because it's almost always different than the way I've learned it. And yeah. sometimes I'm like, okay, this is is this still called this? And so the terminology, it's most of it's the same, but not always. And Gosh. so it's good because while he's explaining to me how he learned it. He's like, oh, never mind. I don't need your help now. <laughs> He's realizing that. So, now. you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's definitely, it's much more open. It's not like you didn't show your stuff exactly like I yeah. needed to see. Like the mimicking thing, like that. The fact that that is there, that you're shifting away from that I think is really important. So thank you. Fascinating. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, like, that was the public being like, you know, participating. We will move on to the item E presentation discussion on the bond refinance. Yeah. Is this, this is me. This is part two of last time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And so um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this this evening. Uh, I did include a short uh, one page or two pages uh, within the, the uh, item. And really what it is is just... A portion of the presentation that we had uh, two board meetings ago and so it was made very loud and clear that really what we want to do is just bring this back to make sure that um, that all we're doing is doing the refinancing and so that is the way we're moving forward with this we're simply doing the refinancing of the bond it's it's the exact same as if you're refinancing your your own personal loan on your house mm -hmm. and so as we move forward uh, we will be bringing back to the governing board in June um, a resolution to move this actually forward. There is no uh, election that would need to be done. This would be simple board action, and it would authorize the district to then go ahead and refinance those bonds that are outstanding, yeah. and it would save the taxpayers dollars. And so there is no benefit to the district other than we're being good fiduciaries uh, and doing the right thing for our taxpayers of the Ross Valley School District. So I just wanted to bring that forward and just make sure that, that the governing board and the public knows that we are moving that forward. And if there are any other questions related no. to that. Great. Any questions from the dais on the, what we had before us? No. no. Okay. You know, this is bringing back in June, right? Mm -hmm. we'll For resolution. Yeah. Yes. And uh, we, we don't have any uh, public, public comment? comment on this. So, and this is just the discussion. So, mm -hmm. we'll have a vote on that. Okay. All Good right. on that well, one. We'll yeah. look forward to seeing this back in June then. Um, and now we are on to item number four, which is, is recommended approval of a resolution authorizing. Okay. A contract. Oh, this is what you had mentioned before about the competitive bid yep. to piggyback on a contract bid. So yes, with yes. You. you again. I see you <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity to mm -hmm. discuss this this evening. Uh, this is a piggyback bid, and this will allow us. What the governing board will be doing is authorizing the resolution, which gives the district the ability to use a piggyback bid, which was a publicly bid uh, uh, item or a bid that went out by the Irvine Unified School District and the winning bid was CDWG. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of that bid, they made it so that it was available to all public entities. And so uh, oftentimes what you'll see is they'll list out specific organizations, but in this particular instance, they listed all California public in, uh, entities. And mm -hmm. so by doing that, we have the ability to use this as our public bid. Mm -hmm. And because these items are over $200,000, as, as you know, these are these are the uh, Google Chromebooks, or Chromebooks, I should say, um, that we would be purchasing. Mm -hmm. They exceed that those bid limits. And so really what we're asking for this evening is just authorization for approval of this resolution uh, to then uh, Go ahead and make that purchase moving forward. And this one is going to be next year budget, this one, or is it this year? We talked about it. You presented that last time, right? Can't remember which period does it 
impact? Is it next to a little bit of both? A little bit of both okay. in, in terms of the timelines. Um, it really depends on how, how soon we can get the items, but we're hoping to get them into the the classrooms. And in reality, it's preparing us for cash testing next year. Yes, it is what you talked about last time. Yeah, so those are the same. Yeah, the ones that are expiring that we talked about from the presentation last month. Yeah. Okay. Very good to do the two two in a row agenda items. Getting yeah. The context right. last month and uh, last week. Not last month. <laughs> last week. <laughs> and then and then the year before. So All right. Are there any question any questions for Chris? Yep. On the process or anything? No. I've got nothing. I'm looking around, not seeing any any other no public comment on this item, since we've got one person who shook her head and said no. Um then what you're looking for is we an action. So we need to have a motion and an action to yeah. approve the piggyback. Contract. So I make a motion. Is it something else, Chris? It's for the resolution. Ah, so the motion is for a resolution zero nine two one two two authorizing. <laughs> We can read it right there. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, I make a motion to approve the resolution 092122, authorizing contract pursuant to cooperative bid and award document from the Arvine Unified School District piggyback contract bid. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion and a second. I'll go for a vote. Marie? Aye. And Rachel? Aye. Ryan? Aye. And Shelly? Aye. Mm -hmm. So you can move that forward. Thank you for bringing that to us. Uh, our next item on the agenda is the consent actions. There are uh, seven items on our consent action docket for this evening. Um, did anyone have any? I would like to pull um, okay. the first item, F1, uh, recommended approval of certificated classified administrative personnel actions. And this is only to pull it to make a title change for one of the positions okay. that's listed on that. Okay. And um, But I think I need to wait until you determine if there's anything else to pull. But we can put it back on. It's only to make a correction to a title. So we put it back on the next No, we would do it tonight. Oh. But I just want to be sure that before I talk about that, that any others of you have anything else on the consent agenda that you would like to pull so that way we can go through those first. So you're just okay. pulling it to amend it and then yes. we'll vote on it. Yeah. I got it. Okay. So it's not going away. Is there any other, no, I'm not any other items? I didn't have any. No. I didn't. Okay. No. So I'm um, on the personnel action under the certificated personnel. Um, Janet Mercer um, was is listed currently as a K-5 school counselor for employment beginning in the 22-23 school year. And um, her position will actually be school social worker. So based on her credential, which is a pupil personnel services credential and school social work, the position um, that she's authorized to have within that is school social work, not okay. school counseling. And okay. we did advertise for the position both ways. And that's what she's moving into. Correct. Not yes. what she currently is. From, Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so what she by position. currently is, is in a classified position. Yeah. So gotcha. that's lower down okay. where you'll see that she is resigning from a classified position. Okay. Yes. And being to, to be employed one. next school year in a certificated position. Okay. Okay. And so the title changes from school counselor to school social worker. Okay. Got it. So that is uh, an amendment to that two, particular yes. item. Mm -hmm. Should they all be approved? Okay. Any? Okay, no, um, no public comment? We've got no public comment with our okay, one public comment is here. So. so with the exception noted before, I make a motion to uh, approve all the consent actions. Um, not not no, except, sorry, not um, except for, it's as um, item with M1 amendments. as amended. As amended. Can someone say that? It's too complicated for so. me. <laughs> I'm just giving up. I can make a motion that we approve consent um, as recommended with the change to that item number one. All right. So there's a motion to approve the consent items with the recommended change to item number one. Oh, I can second. As long as I don't have to repeat this second. entire long sentence. All right. So you motion and a second, Rachel? Aye. Marie? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Shelly? Aye. All right. Consent items are approved. And on to... Board business. So committee updates and reports from trustees since last week. Probably not too many, but yeah, okay. We got, we we got, got one. always something to report. Oh, yes, I, I, I know. It's just the timing with the ones I've got. I guess. All right. What do we got, Rachel? So um, I attended the um, 
District English Language Advisory Committee, oh, yeah. or DLAC, last night. Okay. Okay. Um, it was, you know, those are always really, really fun meetings because I get to brush up on my Spanish. Um, and luckily, or translates where I'm like, I lost sometimes. <laughs> um, but um, it was a good opportunity to kind of go over the summit of LPAC, which is the English Language Proficiency Assessment for California. Mm -hmm. So it's how we, how I guess as a district, they evaluate any English language learners and kind of gives them a basis for like, where to teach from. And they reevaluate towards the end of the year in the spring. And so they've just finished doing all of those those testing and reclassification, which means yeah. that kids get moved up a, a level or they get moved out if they, they prove that they're fluent. So um, it's based on lots of different um, factors. You need to be able to write, listen, speak, um, have a lot of comprehension. So uh, it's, it's always kind of like a win when the kids are able to move out of being in that status. Um, and then uh, we were given some summer resources. Um, TAM District is trying to put together some in, uh, EL courses for adults. So uh, there should be some information coming in about that. Marin County Public Library um, has a new widget. So you can translate their entire website into multiple languages, which wow. is fantastic. Um, they're also offering English classes on Zoom this summer. Um, and you can do them in person in Point Reyes if you feel like traveling all that way. Um, but it's just a great opportunity for, you know, more exposure to English lessons if students need them. Um, and then there were some mental health resources um, in the district and in the community that were shared out. Um, you know, the local, uh, like our district counselors um, or like all their contact, can, uh, contact information was provided um, in what they can help with. And then a warm line that is in English and Spanish. So it's not for emergencies that are life-threatening, but it's a place to have somebody listen and to get info um, on other resources and where to get more help when it's not an emergency. And sometimes it's just someone to listen. Um, and that's in English and Spanish. And then um, there's also a suicide prevention webinar on the 12th, um, and it's it's being offered in Zoom, on Zoom in Spanish as well. So that was another um, mental health uh, resource that was mentioned last night. And then we, um, part of the LCAP, obviously we all know we have to go out to different groups in our community and get feedback on our LCAP. And so um, the local control accountability plan <laughs> for all the, all the, the letters. Um, but it, we were able to go and like ask questions last night and get feedback from families, um, from our English language learner families. And so um, just a little bit was given to them information about what the LCAP is and what the focus is and how it's meant to specifically address um, at-risk youth who need more assistance um, academically. Um, and so uh, that, was, that was pretty much it. There is going to be a survey, a parent survey going out. I think that's probably district-wide, mm -hmm. more so you know. And it's just about how we're serving students. And, it, you know, it's great for feedback. So that was it, DLAC. I have a question Yeah, With DLAC. How, is there a um, connection or interaction between DLAC and our local library here in Fairfax and in San Anselmo? I just imagine that being in terms of like if kids are in the library and they're looking for, you know, language supports, whether the libraries are familiar with the fact that the school district has a group focused on English language learning and awareness of DLAC in our district. Or... That's a great question. I'll ask you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So don't any other? Nope. I don't yeah. have. Uh, I was not able to attend the committee that I was going to go to, but I believe it'll show up in the uh, superintendent's report. Um, so we have now our other board minutes. This is item G2, which is approval of the meeting minutes for May 3rd. Um, I read through those. Yeah. I'm good with them. Um, I, I, I make a motion to approve the. Uh, Okay. May third, uh, um, minutes. All right. Yeah. Second. So motion and a second. And Marie. Uh, aye. Shelley. Aye. Brian. Abstain. You went. Yes. Oh, that's right. You were mm -hmm. there. Aye. Okay. So those minutes pass. And now we're on to superintendent and cabinet report. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, and Chris Carson, anything else? You, again, tonight had the majority of the items. So what else is going on? I just have one item, and okay. that has to do with the May revision, the governor's May revision, and that oh, yeah. does come out this week. And so oh, yeah. we'll be anxiously awaiting and looking at what that looks like and what those numbers do 
in terms of our budget mm -hmm. and also um, listening to see if the governor is still pushing his uh, three-year average of mm -hmm. the, the uh, LCFF ADA, mm -hmm. the local control funding formula ADA, average daily attendance. So it'll well, be interesting to see how that Im yeah. impacts us as we move forward. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Coming out. Okay. Thank you. All right, Julia, anything more from just continuing everything I reported on last week? <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. And um, Eric is not able to join us this evening, student services, so we don't have an update from him, but I'm sure last week's report was very thorough. So um, he said he did not have anything to update us on as well. And uh, so um, from superintendent, um, one of the things I haven't reported was, as you all know, Donna Faulkner has been uh, supporting us this year with all of our COVID response. And unfortunately, because she is in retired status, she does have an earnings limitation and she has reached that. And so unfortunately, it means that all of the fantastic support, well, she does have a couple of hours left to give us between now and the end of the year um, to not exceed that amount. Um, but it means that the responsibilities shifted sure. back to the school sites. Yeah. A lot of the reporting to families is um, going back to the school sites. So with the school administrative assistant and the principal. And then, of course, with Teresa um, here, um, absolutely anytime they need any kind of support, she is there to help them as well. And we also um, rely heavily on our nurse, um, Megan O'Hare. So a huge thank you to everybody involved. Um, but it's definitely um, missed to have... Um, Donna not there uh, with us to help us um, navigate because the guidelines do continue to change. We're in the process. We've just crafted um, an email that will be going out um, tomorrow to all of our families and staff letting um, them know. And just some reminders, because as we all know, COVID is um, absolutely um, surging. If you read the IJ article that's been impacting um, schools, we definitely have some positives um, in our schools. and. Um, just reminding everybody to please take care of themselves and follow the guidelines as best they can and um, be really mindful because for all of our students who miss school, it does impact their learning. And so we want to be sure that students are in school um, as much as possible. And then, of course, our employees, because uh, with the sub shortage, it is difficult um, and folks are still having to cover um, for um other positions when people are out. So we're hoping that um, we don't see a huge surge in our school district, um, but it is definitely big in um, countywide and a lot of still the household exposures. Um, so we can say, you know, as you may have seen another article in the IJ a few weeks ago in which um, students who attended the Washington DC trip, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do not remember, recall seeing any reports of any positive from any of our students who attended so um that trip so we were lucky there where other middle schools um, in the county were definitely hit hard um and so we're looking forward to closing out the school year with all of our in-person activities exciting to start planning for um, promotion ceremonies and um, other exciting activities as the kids um, finish out i think we have five weeks left can't believe this year it's crazy. It's going by super fast. And um, so on that note, I um, just want to recognize that Donna, unfortunately, um, hopefully she will be able to be back with us next year because we will still need that support and the administrative yep. assistants um, are asking um, to also, you know, can we please have whatever availability Donna has next year? Is that is that limit on a school year or a calendar year? It's a school year. Gotcha. Yeah. And so there's a... Um, a a dollar amount limitation. It's not an hours limitation, but we track it by hours because we can estimate how much she would make. So um, she's been tracking her hours um, very closely this year. Um, and unfortunately, with the amount of COVID, it just didn't get us through the end. Um, not that but yeah, she has set up some great systems. So um, it's been fabulous to have her support there. Um, and two meetings uh, that we had uh, last week, uh, Friday, were Superintendents Council and Roundtable. Um, Roundtable is the group that um, is made up, or it, the purpose of the group is to ensure parity across all of the school sites mm -hmm. around fundraising and um, taking care to make sure that um, all of the school's parent club, parent organizations, as well as the YES Foundation are mindful of each other's fundraising efforts. And we do have an agreement um, in place called the Roundtable Agreement. And in there, wherever there is an overage at the end of a school year that a parent organization raises, um, the Roundtable determines 
where does that overage go? And so um, at this week's meeting, we were taking a look at the 2019 and 2020 um, school years in which uh, fundraising occurred or did not. And what the roundtable ultimately agreed upon is to um, not, it's a wash. A school, as an example, in 1920 had an overage, but in 2021, they were unable to even make their um, per capita amount or reach their fundraising goal. And so with how much the um, COVID, the pandemic has impacted our schools, um, that was the best way that the um, roundtable decided to do with that. So um, the next phase that we started last school year with roundtable, but COVID impacted us too much to be able to finish it, was to create a common budget reporting template that yes. each of the schools will use. Yes. And um, their, the treasurers uh, commented that they think it's pretty well close to being finished, but um, they all agreed that they would um, meet again um, via email. They thought that's how close they were to just take another look at that and um, finish it up so that we can then begin implementing that in the next school year. The other thing that we need to do going forward with Roundtable a big project is to take a look at the roundtable agreement. A mm -hmm. lot of the fundraisers that each of the schools do, as an example, they're no longer called Lapapong. They're called Movapong. And so changing the names because they're spelled out in the roundtable agreement. And there are some other areas where Chris and I are new. Even in my old role, I did not attend uh, roundtables for the district. So a lot of um, the purpose of the group and an understanding of it um, is very different. Um, and not clearly laid out in the roundtable agreement. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we would like to ensure that anybody who picks up the roundtable mm -hmm. agreement, that agreement is <coughs> So that'll be a big project that we're gonna work mm -hmm. on um, next school year. And then of course, we'll take a look at the uh, fundraising efforts for 22, uh, 21, 22 this school year, in the fall of next school year, and determine if there were any overages, where will they go? Um, and so that's roundtable. And then superintendent's council is, um, pretty much the same membership, except we have also um, added representatives from our DLAC, yep. our English language learner mm -hmm. um, parent group, as well as our uh, parent guardian racial equity task force. And the sole focus of this last meeting on Friday was input into our LCAP. So is um, Julia now, and we all will be taking uh, that input and further refining our LCAP. And it's really, last year, as you know, was the big years, the three year cycle. Mm -hmm was what we worked on last year to get going. And so 21 two is 21, 22. This school year is the first year of the three-year cycle. Next year will just be revisions um, to our LCAP. We won't be kind of starting over. And um, as we all know that no endeavor that you start really can be completed in a one-year project. And so our priorities for our district are going to continue um, into yep. next school year. So access, um, ensuring student learning, student progress, social emotional development, and learning for the kids as well. And so um, those priorities. And another um, benefit too of having these surveys that um, that were mentioned, Rachel, oh, Rachel. from Mass Science DLAC, um, is that that input from every single parent and every single student will also be doing a staff survey as well. And so we'll be having a lot of um, input to help us to understand what is our climate in our district? How do students perceive that they're doing in our school district? How is, what's, um, do they have an adult access? And then from the parent perspective, and then also um, a different type of set of questions which we haven't started on yet, because uh, we're using a group called Panorama. And so, um, as we all know, your survey question is only good, or your results are only good as the question you ask. And so Panorama is a group that does surveys for a living and they are able to be nationally normed as well. So we not only can take this year's re, um, results and start our baseline, but we also know how we compare nationally mm -hmm. in terms of how folks um, are feeling in and about our schools. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, and so that's Roundtable and Superintendent's Council I don't have anything to add to the DLAC uh, from last night. And so some upcoming meetings, our Parent Guardian Equity Task Force, we have a planning meeting this Thursday and our final meeting of the year is uh, Tuesday the 24th. And um, then we're gonna be starting uh, next week, we come back with our music department and um, Julia, myself and Matt Katanzari to talk about um, 
how we will be staffing music for next year, mm -hmm. given that we had a resignation of mm -hmm. one of our teachers. So we're going to be taking a look in-house, mm -hmm. first of all, and looking at any shifts and changes to programming as then we will begin to advertise yeah. and get going on uh, filling any vacancy that we will have. Nice. So I think that's it. Oh, and this week, most importantly, Staff Appreciation Week. Woohoo! Appreciate Yay! all of our Ross Valley classified, certificated, confidential management, all of our employees in our school district. And so that's exciting. So that's it. This is good. Okay. All right. Any questions or? Budget. All right. Well then, we don't. We are at the closing item. Here is the meeting review uh, in terms of future board topics, board dates, um, any other debrief items. We do not have another meeting next week. But this we is good news. One. Um, May 31st. May 31st. And then the one after that comes June 14th. So it comes up pretty quickly two in two weeks yes. after that. So May 31st and then June 14th. Um, and as always, um, we've got a couple of items we all know are going to come back to us from tonight. But if there are other items that come up between now and then, you uh, know it's in the plenty on Tuesdays. So get that information to Marcia or I and we will work it in. All right, then it is, what time is it? 9.22. 9.22, and I will adjourn the meeting.